Welcome to the Pint Glass Football Podcast. This is Pint Glass Football. We talk NFL and college football. I'm your host, Brad Fowler. Pintglassfootball.com is the website. Be sure to subscribe, rate, and review the podcast. What's up, PGF Nation? National Championship game just ended. We decided to do a reaction podcast to the big win for Michigan, plus NFL Black Monday, some coaches getting fired. We're going to touch on that as well. But joining me, of course, my co-host, Alex Higdon. Alex, we texted a lot during this game, like we usually do, especially during these big games. Let's start with your initial reaction to the win for Michigan. This was a close game for a big stretch. The final score, it got a little out of hand late in the game. I don't think it reflects how good of a game we just saw, but Michigan gets the big win, caps off a pretty awesome college football playoff and a pretty amazing college football season, but your thoughts? Yeah, Brad, like you said, we texted a lot. I mean, like you said, the score does is indicative of what really happened. It's really the fourth quarter where kind of things spread out a little bit more, but tightly contested a lot of... Uh, Thoughts I think we had during the game that we'll get into in this uh, next half hour. I thought this was going to be a key matchup in this game, and it definitely played out that way, was the middle of that Washington offensive line. Now, we know Washington has great tackles, but I thought if there was a vulnerable spot for Washington, it was going to be the middle of that O-line where Michigan's defensive tackles, some of the best in the country. I thought that was a key matchup to watch, and I felt like Michigan won that battle. I think it made a big difference in this ballgame. Again, when you look at this Michigan rushing attack, 38 carries for 303 yards. You know, if you simply take Washington's passing yards plus, of which was 255 yards by Michael Penix Jr., and their total rushing yards, that equals 301. So Michigan rushed for Washington's entire offense in total. Wow. that That's amazing. That tells a lot. You know, sometimes you can run for 300 yards, but if a guy can hit you over the top, hit you over the top, you know, you can still keep pace. But they just completely dominate. I mean, sometimes when you look at some of these games and when you see some of these people and now you get to key in and watch, I can imagine what a Washington and Michigan pro day will look like, specifically concentrated on the line of scrimmage on both sides. I mean, there was some weakness on Washington, but we know there's some strengths there as well. But that Michigan offensive line and defensive line, I think we're looking at some guys. I think we're looking at guys that are going to be going one between the first and the third round in the next couple of drafts. Yeah, there's no doubt about it. And it felt like early in the game, Michigan was just pounding the ball. They're winning the line of scrimmage. And, and they really did for the most part throughout this game. But when they get up early and they get up that 14-3 to lead and with their ability to run the ball and control the clock, it, it, was, it was feeling like we might be looking at a blowout there early in the game. It, it was looking like, okay, Michigan is really imposing their will physically on Washington. Washington was really having a hard time stopping them. I believe uh, I texted you Washington was running for over 12 yards for carry in the first half. But then late in the game, I thought Washington kind of got, or excuse me, Michigan got a little cute and started getting a little too pass happy and going away from the run, trying to throw too much on first and second down, had a couple quick three and outs. All of a sudden, Washington gets the ball back late in the first half, scores that touchdown, and we, have, and we got a ball game at halftime. And yes. Absolutely. And then coming out of halftime, we were all anticipating that opening drive of them coming out of the half. But lo and behold, they threw an interception, which may have perhaps killed some momentum coming out of the half where they could have maybe at least got some points on the board and given them some type of a little bit more momentum as they, the game matriculated forward. Yeah, Alex, I tweeted at halftime that this opening drive for Washington could determine the outcome. I said, if they score a touchdown here, Michigan is in trouble because it felt like they had really captured the momentum at that point. And then I went on to say, if Michigan gets a stop and gets back to the run, I like their chances. Well, that's exactly like you said. It's exactly what they did. That first play of the second half, they get that huge interception. They weren't able to really capitalize on it with a the touchdown. They get the field goal. Washington gets the ball back. Michigan makes a big stop. 
holding them to a field goal. So you basically just trade three there. And, and we just had a great back and forth game. Like, like we said, until it got late in this game, the one thing I was impressed with is you talked about the rushing total and you talked about how Michigan was able to run, run the ball. But in the second half, I was actually really impressed with Washington and that coaching staff being able to limit the run and keep them in this ball game until late. I paused there for a moment because there was just so many things. I, I just really, to, specifically one drop, that Will Nixon, I believe it was Will Nixon. I, I'm pretty sure it was Will Nixon. That Will Nixon drop, Michael Penix hit him in stride. I mean, if I, looking at that play, if he puts his foot in the ground, that's seven. And this is in this in this game is now twenty to twenty going forward. But he dropped that I'm sorry, twenty to twenty seven. He dropped that ball and I I just that that was just a huge, huge, huge momentum killer, especially when you could not run the ball. We already knew Dylan Johnson was coming into the game injured. He only had eleven carries for thirty three thirty three yards. I mean, the Michigan front line doesn't allow rushing to begin with. And on top of that, he was injured. So points were going to be at a premium for Washington. The offense was really going to be through the air. And when you are one dimensional against a team like Michigan, you can't afford to have those type of mistakes against a team like this. Yeah, there was a a handful of big missed opportunities by Washington. That one certainly stands out. The wide open pass to Roma Dunze, I believe it was, oh, yes. on that deep ball. Yes, absolutely. You know, and we hadn't seen Pinnock's miss a throw like that all year. You know, a wide open guy like that, his number one target, and he just flat out missed him. That would have been a huge play. It was, I believe it was on third down. So that was a huge momentum play as well. There was a few of those that I think when Washington goes back and watches the tape, it's going to be really tough to swallow knowing that they kind of left some points on the board. They left some big plays on the board that could have changed the outcome of this game. One thing that really surprised me in this game too, Alex, when Washington in the second half, Washington started doing a really good job of stopping Michigan on first and second down when they were trying to continue to establish a run. They put Michigan in a lot of third and long situations in that second half. And when they got them in third and long, they were bringing pressure. They were bringing blitzers up the middle. They were bringing multiple guys in the A-gaps and really trying to force McCarthy to make quick decisions with the football and put pressure on him. The one adjustment I was surprised we didn't see was any screen passes. I thought there was multiple times where I thought, this is a pro time. They're going to keep blitzing you on third. Like, set up a screen here. And we never really saw that adjustment. Another thing that I was kind of calling for on Twitter was, I thought McCarthy in the second half was going to have to be was going to have to be more of a playmaker with his legs in this game, and we saw it in some key moments in that second half. You know, Brad, there was a play in the fourth quarter where the score was still twenty to thirteen by Michigan. Michigan, and they went three play went three and out three plays five yards. Washington forced them to punt, and I think I texted you. I said this was a great stop, and it gives them good field position. They punted the ball and it and they started Washington started their drive at their own thirty three yard line, so that's good field position in terms of how this game had been playing out. And do you know what Washington did with that possession, which I thought was a key possession? It was the possession before Michigan opened it up and scored on their next possession. Washington had three plays and gained one yard. You can't do that in a critical situation. You have to be able to move the ball. You have to dig into your playbook. You need to pull out some plays that you maybe perhaps you hadn't been using before, but they literally went three plays for one yard and punted the ball, and Michigan ended up scoring on that ensuing possession, making it 27-13, and then we know what happened going towards the end of the game. But I thought and when I saw that they could not do anything with that position, I start to feel that this was going to start to get dire for Washington. Yeah, it's a great point, Alex. You're right, because there was a long stretch of this game where it was 20 to 13, and it just felt like Michigan was kind of hanging on. It just felt like Michigan's kind of hanging on, holding on to that one touchdown lead, and knowing Washington and how explosive they are, I think Herb Street and Fowler even alluded to this on the on the broadcast. It feels like Washington is just one big play away 
from being right back in this game. We know how explosive that offense can be. And it just felt like they never quite got that play. They had one big pass play down the sideline, but they just weren't able to capitalize enough on those big plays. And I got to give a lot of credit to that Michigan secondary. Well, let me just say the defense in general. The secondary, I thought, played lights out. But I also think that that front four for Michigan, they didn't have to blitz in this game. And I think that was really key to this ball game because Michigan was able to get pressure consistently with their front four and allow, allowed them to drop a lot of guys back into coverage. And they just did a great job. This was an outstanding coaching job by Harbaugh and that staff on the defensive side of the ball, especially. There, it was a 41 yard pass play to Colston Loveland, which was a key play where the game was still in the balance where it could have gone either way where Washington could have perhaps gained some momentum. I mean, they basically had, that was a great uh, play calling. You talked about it by Sharon Moore on that drive, specifically that 41 yard pass play, which opened up that drive on their side of the field to get them to midfield and then go on driving in the score again. But you pointed out how Sharon Moore, that specific drive, you pointed that one out. That was the type of drive and play calling that I was looking for from Washington on the drive that I mentioned previously. Yeah, huge tip of the cap to Sharon Moore because there was a time early in this game, late in the first half, where I felt like, and I talked about this earlier, where I felt like Michigan kind of got cute on offense. And they got away from the run when clearly the run was working and they tried dialing up too many passing plays and they had a couple consecutive three and outs and it opened the door up for Washington. Well, Sharon Moore made the all-time adjustment there in the second half on that drive in particular because he saw Washington selling out to stop the run, putting guys in the box, dropping safeties in the box. The linebackers were starting to cheat up against the run and he called the perfect play action pass to the tight end over the middle it set up that big play he had a couple other nice plays later in that drive with some misdirection stuff that we hadn't seen prior to that getting McCarthy out of the pocket and away from the pressure it, it really was it that was really the drive of the game and during the broadcast we saw JJ McCarthy after that touchdown going up to Moore and, and pushing him and and kind of getting excited and going back and forth you could tell you could see the excitement and the juice from that Michigan sideline Congrats to Michigan. But I do want to ask you this, Brad. With this game, how do you look at Michael Penix Jr. after this game? Do you think he's been able to push himself up? I don't know where you looked at him before. How do you look at him now? Has he pushed himself or solidified himself in the top 10? Or did you think he pushed himself up into the top five? Obviously, guys, you guys know listen, who listen to this podcast, PGF Nation. We do a deep dive come April, come draft time. For you guys that have been listening to the pod, you guys know we're, we're going to dive into tape and really get after the breakdowns on all these guys coming up in the offseason. But as, as kind of a reaction to your question, Alex, I think right now, without doing the deep dive that I think it deserves, I think Michael Penix is probably in the discussion for the number three quarterback in this class. I think that probably puts him in the top 10. I mean, obviously this game, if he would have had a really good game, it would have helped his stock. But I think most scouts and, and most GMs, I think they're smart enough to know you got to look at the, the whole body of work. And this was a big test, though, and there's no doubt about it. And, and this, this game is going to be looked at heavily from the standpoint of Washington went up against the best defense they had played all year. He went up against a lot of NFL caliber defensive players, a lot of guys that are going to play on Sunday. He was under pressure a lot in this game, and he didn't handle it that well. But we talked about it going into this game, Alex. We said the key to this game is going to be getting Michael Penix off of his spot because he is a true pocket passer. He's really at his best when he can sit back in the pocket and, and get through his progressions and make accurate throws. The key to beating him, and Michigan knew it, was to push the pocket and to get him uncomfortable. And even when they weren't getting sacks, they were getting him uncomfortable in this game. And it certainly affected his ability to make plays down the field. Obviously, with the big turnover, a couple big turnovers in this game, a couple big missed opportunities. I like Penix as a NFL quarterback. I think he's a slightly better prospect than a Tua uh, Tagovailoa, but it's but a similar grade. A, a guy that's a pocket passer, not overly athletic, but he can move a little bit very accurate left-handed quarterback. There's a lot of similarities there, and they both have injury history. 
which is a concern going into the draft. But that'll be a lot of fun to break down later in the offseason, certainly. And those of us who are video game fans, EA Sports, what happened to uh, college football? You were supposed to debut a commercial during this game. What happened? Alex, I saw something about that on Twitter, and I was too busy involved in the game and i and i kind of saw i briefly saw some people talking about that on twitter during this game well, f- fill me in here so this game was supposed to come out or at least the re- the release of this game was supposed to come out or some information about it what, what's the story there well basically ea is finally relaunching ncaa football uh, those of us who are madden fans have been disappointed with the game for the past maybe three to four years usually they come out they fix the game every five years but With them losing FIFA and now having the rights in the NIL deal, they can bring back NCAA football, which will now have the players' names before we used to just play with the numbers. But with the recruiting aspect in the game as well as the NIL piece in the game, we video game fans are eagerly waiting to play a game like this because for years we have been deprived of having a college football game. They were supposed to debut a commercial to kind of get us hyped up because the game's coming out next year and we got nothing. Black Monday was a little bit lackluster this year, but there was some notable moves here. Atlanta decides to fire coach Arthur Smith. That was just hours after a blowout loss to the New Orleans Saints. We also saw that the commanders moved on from Ron Rivera I expected a little more shakeup. Maybe in the next day or two, we're going to see more. So we're going to have another podcast here on our regular scheduled Thursday episode. Maybe we'll have some more news and discussions then. But give me your thoughts on these coaches being released and and what did you make of it? Well, I think we saw that one coming at the beginning of the season. This is one that we knew he was immediately going to come on the hot seat, that we immediately thought he was, this was, probably looking at something that was going to be a handoff to Eric Bieniemy, And after this season, after going through the entire season, I'm not even sure if that's the case. But we know Ron Rivera has been let go. We know that they brought in Bob Myers, who of the Golden State Warriors fame, has been brought in as part of the evaluation team on what they should be, the consultant team, to know who they should be looking at in terms of going for another coach. There's already been bantied about Ben Johnson. And of course, you know, If you've been listening to this podcast for, I don't know, the probably past eight to nine weeks, I've been saying, win or lose the national championship, Jim Harbaugh was leaving. And my speculation was to the Chargers, but I believe that this was, he has coached his last game at Michigan this season. So his name has been bantied about in terms of talking about the commanders. So I think this is not a big shock. I mean, this is the change ownership. Ownership's going to want to bring in their own people, Magic. And the uh, 76 owners are going to want to bring in their own people to set this team up for the success that they believe in. So not surprised, not a big deal with this one. Yeah, especially when at the trade deadline, you go and, and move two of your best players to your best pass rushers. I think the writing was on the wall at that point. We knew that it was only a matter of time. They were going to let Ron Rivera finish the season and and they were going to move on. So not shocking. He was on the hot seat. When when you only win four games and you're on the hot seat, that that's pretty much the end of it. I mean, let's face it. When he took over, Rivera started with a 7 and 9 record in 2020, but they never got any better after that point. They went 7 and 10 in 2021, 8 8 and 1 in 2022, and then like I said this year going just 4 and 13, it just really fell apart. Atlanta, the moving or moving on from Arthur Smith, This was one that I think maybe a few weeks ago might have been a little more surprising, but the way they finished the season, I think kind of sealed his fate. Three straight seasons of seven and 10, finished with an overall record of 21 and 30 as the Falcons head coach, no playoff appearances. I think if they would have shown some improvement this year, I think he probably gets another chance to come back. But when you fall apart at the end of the year like they did, that bad loss to the uh, to the Carolina Panthers, you get blown out by the Saints. The team just didn't really seem like it was headed anywhere. It never established any type of identity. And the fact that he's an offensive guy, you've got all these young weapons, and he never really was able to unlock any of these guys. Of course, the name to watch is Bill Belichick. We're still kind of waiting to hear because there's been a lot of rumors and a lot of reports that they could potentially move off of Belichick. We haven't heard anything at the time of this recording. We haven't heard anything yet. There's also been some reports that he's been linked 
to possibly replacing Ron Rivera in Washington. So that's going to be an interesting story to follow. I think some of the reason this was a little bit lackluster is because we had so many firings in season this year. Josh McDaniels for the Raiders, Frank Reich for the Panthers, and Brandon Staley already for the Chargers. So that's part of the reason why we didn't see as many guys let go. I'm sure there's going to be some more. Also, two general managers, Raiders Dave Ziegler and Chargers Tom Telesco also let go. So a, a lot of turnover. We see it every year. It's a story to follow, and we will be following it, of course, here on Pint Glass Football. But guys, thanks for checking out our reaction pod to the national championship. Congratulations to the Michigan Wolverines and college football as a whole. What a season. What a way to put an end to college football this season. Like I said, we'll be back Thursday. NFL playoffs, big time preview. We're going to go through all the wild card games, make our picks. I'm Brad Fowler. He's Alex Higdon. This is Pint Glass Football, and we'll catch you next time. Thanks for listening to the Pint Glass Football Podcast. Be sure to subscribe and follow us on Twitter at PGF Podcast.